Okay, so this week saw the release of DeepSeek, a brand new AI model that seems to have been warmly received and also has had the knock-on effect of um, causing a huge drop in NVIDIA's share price. Oliver, this is all out of my particular comfort zone, but you love talking about AI. So um, what's going on here? Why, why is um, DeepSeek seen as being disruptive? And why is NVIDIA's share price tanking as a result? Yeah, I mean, there's so much to discuss here. <laughs> so much to discuss here. I'll get to right. the share price part. But first, I want to discuss as to why this is such an important development in AI. So DeepSeek, which is a Chinese AI company, introduced V3 in December, which I actually talked about the last time we talked about AI. And that's a very significant model for two reasons. The first reason is that the final training cost of their model was less than six million US dollars, um, according to various reports. And that is important because usually these models cost a lot more than that. Um, that's yeah. not necessarily the entire training cost of the model because they could have had other training runs, but the final training run, less than $6 million. It's also very significant because relative to other um, LLMs that are competitive with it, it costs way less to run. It costs about one thirtieth as much to run as GPT-40. It's super cheap, super efficient. Like the kinds of efficiencies here in any other field of software are crazy, but in AI, this stuff happens pretty frequently, but it's still exciting uh, when it does happen. So R1 was released a little bit over a week ago as of this recording, and it's based off that V3 model. It's basically a reasoning model that uses V3 as its base model. So it uses a chain of thought kind of technique, just like GPT-01, to break down a problem into constituent parts and work through it. Ultimately, the key difference here is that it's competitive with O1, so not 4O, now O1, which is the most advanced model of um, uh, open AIs that's currently available for consumers. Um, but it costs again, about a 30th as much. So that's a big deal. Oh. Um, it's also a wow. lot of fun to use. I have to admit, because it exposes its reasoning to the end user. So you can see it, think through what you're asking it in real time. You can like, it's like seeing someone's thoughts right before they say what they that's want to say. Cool. To you. So it's very fascinating. Now, O1 has the same behavior, but they just summarize the thoughts because presumably they don't want you to train on its actual reasoning process to replicate their model, right? Here, they're they're not afraid to let you replicate their model at all. Um, they're just happy to show you the reasoning process. And that is super, super fascinating, super, super fascinating. Um, it is very, very inspiring. I would say it's very, very efficient. It radically decreases the costs of running advanced AI workloads and even better, the DeepSeek team produced a detailed paper explaining the model, how they trained it, how it works, and the model is open source. So you can run it yourself on local hardware. And even more exciting, they produce different versions of it that run using different base models. So you can run a version based on Quen or Llama that might be a lot smaller than the V3 base model, but can run on a consumer graphics card or even a phone. Though it's sort of funny to use it when you use it with a really weak base model, like a 3 billion Lama 3B or something, because you're seeing this little tiny model try to think, but it's too stupid to think through. <laughs> so it's like fumbling, it's, it's hilarious. It's a really fun model to use again, because you see that reasoning process. And it's really critical to hear because this is a model that, you know, I have copies of it here. I'll have it forever. No one can take that from me. And it's a really advanced model, right? It's really cool. It's cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's great for all kinds of companies because it brings LM capabilities up to a really high baseline of performance. And it's better than arguably anything from any AI model, any AI provider rather, except OpenAI. Now, why did it tank NVIDIA's share price? It tanked NVIDIA's share price. Well, tanked is generous. I think their, their share price went down by about 15%, which is big. But you know, if you look at NVIDIA's share price over five years, it's, it's, I think they could survive a 15% loss possibly, right. um, possibly uh -huh. given that they're worth over $3 trillion still, I believe. Uh, but basically if AI gets radically more efficient, everything held equal, then the demand for NVIDIA GPUs will go to zero basically. But uh -huh. there are some key caveats, right? Um, AI efficiency improvements historically have not reduced demand. They've instead led to more and more compute heavy models that have just pushed demand further and harder. And increasingly, we're going to see models that are used in agentic ways. So are basically primarily prompting themselves or being prompted with visual input or audio input or text input that's being generated instead of human input through prompts. And those autonomous models can obviously occupy a GPU for much longer without needing direct human input. Um, it's also probably, I think, 
because DeepSeq R1 getting released increases the chances of US export controls on GPUs becoming greater to China in particular, but other countries as well, that also decreases the market potentially for NVIDIA GPUs. Finally, I, I would just say here, it's not totally clear exactly what the future holds for NVIDIA there, um, in part because the uh, these inferencing based models, these reasoning models cost very little to train relative to inference. They use a lot more time spent at inference than training. And you can run models like these in a much wider range of hardware than you can train them. You have to train them in NVIDIA GPUs, but you can run them on anything basically. So that's certainly an area where NVIDIA might be concerned. But on the flip side, of course, the models are getting so powerful now that any additional margin of intelligence has so much upside that you can possibly justify pretty enormous expenses. So it's really hard to see where that goes in terms of like <laughs> the valuation of NVIDIA or their share price or the relative market position of NVIDIA relative to other firms. But yeah, just kind of a lot of thoughts there, but uh, certainly very interesting. And then of course, AI is moving so quickly now that as we speak, and uh, OpenAI is preparing to launch their O3 model or at least their O3 mini model, which will be faster still, that should be out today. So um, the state of the art in the LLMs is continuing to be pushed out and pushed out further as various advancements go through. And even like this deep seek paper, now I'm sure everyone at every major AI provider in the United States is going to try to replicate some of their techniques and improve their own models mm -hmm. further. So it just keeps accelerating and accelerating. Interesting. Yeah, the That's whole cool. sort of share price thing. I mean, you know, the whole concept of the share of, of share prices is basically based on belief, really. <laughs> really hard data. I just can't really... Uh, see any kind of scenario where the need for more performance um you know they're always going to need more performance therefore you know it's still going to be uh, a requirement to get nvidia hardware i don't know i don't really know about this but it's certainly interesting stuff it's also really interesting to see that uh, the radeon 7900 xtx seems to be a bit of a hero product for running it uh, it's, yeah, it's really good yeah. apparently <laughs> yeah, if you can fit your model in, in VRAM, of course, because the 7900 XTX does not have a ton of VRAM, if you can fit your model in VRAM, um, then yeah, it's super fast, super fast. At What's the sort of requirement then? Because that's got 24 gigs. They, I mean, conceivably, AMD could maybe do a 48 gigabyte version of that card. Oh my well, God. that would actually be very useful for Llama 70 billion, because I think with 4-bit quantization, that model will fit in 48 gigs of VRAM, I believe. That's wow. the model that I use on my Mac Studio here. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, the, the thing is, is that R1 comes in so many different flavors. It, it basically works with like, I don't know, like 10 different base models, ranging all the way from like 3 billion, I think, at the low end, to 600 billion at the top end. So wow. in terms of um, number of parameters, um, and, and that has a direct correlation with how much me me memory you would need um, for your to run your model in VRAM. So yeah, uh, a 48 gigabyte model would help, but also at the high end, you really start to talk about processors like maybe a Strix Halo wired up to a ton of VRAM. Maybe that would be super mm -hmm. helpful for this, or a Mac Studio. You're talking about computers that can use desktop memory basically for mm -hmm. um, for their video applications. That's that's really mm -hmm. kind of what you would want for a model like this and not so much a really compute heavy uh, card that's a little bit um, more VRAM light. I'm curious what you actually use these models for, Oliver. Oh, I just, it, lo, in terms of the stuff I use locally, it's just not too much, but uh, th that's just for fun. But in terms of like stuff, um, I actually did not have a very good use for LLMs until fairly recently, like within the past few months. But now that LLMs have search functionality built into them, like you can do web search with them, I find right. them increasingly useful for research. And there's uh, also there's a, a model called Gemini with deep research that's very useful if you need to understand something, like if you need to summarize a variety of content, let's say about a game, you want that to inform your your reasoning, but you don't have time to read a ton of websites, you can use Gemini with deep research to do that research for you. And it will search through hundreds of websites in some cases. So there are useful applications of it for research and things like that. But in terms of 
like the work that we do here day to day or like anything like that. It doesn't, LMs don't really slot into our workflow at all <laughs> too much right. uh, in, in general because we're working, because the kind of information that we're working with, the fact that it's so visual, the fact that we're generated, generating it in real time, the fact that like probably 50% plus of my work time is just spent playing and capturing games, to be frank. Like that's something mm -hmm. that LMs don't slot into at all. They can slot into a little bit in the writing process, but I write super quickly and I don't want them, don't want the LMs involved in that process. Uh, and they aren't, they don't do a very good job, frankly. So yeah, there are a few areas where I use them. I also just use them as a replacement for Google just personally, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because I think it, it, they generally give better answers than Google. They're smarter. They can contextualize information in a better way than Google can. They can summarize information in a better way than Google can. They're just more useful than Google is for a lot of, uh, practical applications. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alex, do you have any <laughs> questions or thoughts? Well, I was actually wondering about like <clears throat> PCIe, uh, like if you run, can you spill over VRAM into the, you know, standard memory of a PC to run one of these models or is it so detrimental to its performance that you wouldn't want to do that? Um, uh, I don't know. And uh, just hearing you, there's a lot of things that I thought about about parallels to other aspects of computing, like every single time a new generation of consoles come out. Um, they give them all this new hardware. And typically what's been done until rather recently is we just make 30 FPS better looking. And I almost <laughs> feel like this could be like that. Uh, we just make the bottle better now that it's so much more efficient. We, we pile on more. Yeah. Uh, but I am also reminded of like when IBM PC clones came out, um, you know, having the ability to just do it better and cheaper from different places now from a more open source like alternative uh, it would only just make the market explode at that point, wouldn't it? Just kind of like it did with the PC clones. So I don't know. I see a lot of interesting parallels, and I'm very curious to see what happens next. But what about PCIe? Do you know anything about that? I don't know. Um, I'm, well, I believe, though I haven't tested this myself, is that it really just hurts performance, like it kills performance on higher-end cards to a point where it's not really usable. I think that's basically the case there. Um, when you spill over into system memory, that's, I think, what happens typically there. But personally, I don't really use these models typically on uh, consumer-grade graphics cards because I have a Mac Studio that can run the really big models um, that consumer graphics cards cannot use, at, le at least at reasonable speeds. So that's where I tend to run my AI models and probably where I'll tend to run my AI models in the future. Like the Mac Studio is a really good vehicle for these kinds of models. But yeah, just in, in general, like it's... I don't know, LLM progress is super exciting right now. There was a long period where LLMs were not advancing that quickly and like now it's going super, super quickly, scarily quickly in a lot of respects. Uh, that's really exciting. Um, and this reasoning paradigm is really, really cool because they've discovered a new way to scale these models in a way that doesn't take six months to a year to train a new model. You can graft it onto existing models and greatly improve their performance essentially. And it does seem like probably, you know, I mean, I'm going to be frank in the next like one or two years, probably there are LLMs that are, you know, super intelligent in some respects when it comes to science, math, reasoning, coding, at least in some, some of those domains, uh, that seems to be coming on pretty quick uh, here because LLMs are already like, O3 is already in the top, like 200 professional coders in the world. It's already scoring incredibly on all these benchmarks. Indeed, there's a problem in LLM um, metrics right now where the LLMs are saturating benchmarks are getting to 80, 90, 100% on the benchmark so quickly that we have to come up with new benchmarks that are increasingly composed of like some of the world's hardest questions, some questions that PhDs would struggle with, tasks that mm -hmm. would involve like a team of people working for days to solve, things like that. So that's, that's super, super impressive. And um, yeah, things seem to be proceeding unabated. <laughs> so... Uh, I guess it's it's a possibly exciting and possibly a slightly scary time, but it's uh, it's certainly progressing quite quickly.